Today, we are continuing in the book of James. Pastor Jerry has covered kind of highlights of chapter one and two, and today we're gonna go into chapter three. We can't cover everything in the book of James. We're just kind of hitting the main theme of every chapter. So I wanna challenge you to go read for yourself. Don't just take our word for it, but go read the book of James, dive into it alongside this series that we're doing and see what else God wants to show you. See what else he wants to reveal to you through the, the word of God, which is living and active, amen? amen? And James is a really practical book. It is the boots on the ground action playbook of the Bible. You know, Jesus, Jesus preached the gospel and then Paul in the, in the epistles takes the gospel and kind of breaks it down and shows us what it's like. Now, James kind of assumes you know the gospel and then he tells us what it looks like if you really live it. So this is kind of like the, the meat and potatoes, amen? amen. You're gonna have to um, kind of put on your, your big boy, big girl pants today because James is stepping on some toes in chapter three. And it's not my fault. I'm just, the, I'm just the messenger. We're reading the Bible and you gotta take it up with the Lord what you're gonna hear today because it's challenging stuff. But I wanna encourage you, let this be convicting, not condemning, okay? Because the, the Holy Spirit wants to convict us so that things can change, not condemn us so we just feel bad, okay? There's a difference because God wants to set you free. He wants to make you better. He wants you to get better. Not just feel better, but actually get better, Amen. So we're gonna dive in today. We're gonna to read James chapter three, verses one through 12. So I wanna read through that with you. And if you wanna follow along, you can. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, passage. And as I start reading, you're gonna realize it's a challenging passage too. James chapter three, verses one two, through 12. You can follow along with me. <clears throat> it says, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church for we who teach will be judged more strictly. That is humbling right there. Before I go on, that is, that is one of the most challenging verses I believe for pastors to hear and understand that, man, I'm not gonna answer to the people for what I share, I'm answering to the Lord. And the same with Pastor Jerry, man, he's up here every Sunday pouring his heart out and he's not doing it, he's not worried about people judging him, he's worried about the Lord. He's responsible to God and our responsibility is to receive and to pray for and, 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 and to lift up that man of God, that woman of God who's, who's bringing the word because it is a scary place to be. So that's a side note, but verse two, indeed, we all make many mistakes. Anybody, anybody in that category? Okay. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a bit, a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn the pilot wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire and a tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body and it can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. Woo! Getting warm. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and curses come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Uh, does spring water bubble out of both fresh? Or does a spring of water bubble out both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Woo! All right, you ready to dive into that today? There's a lot of of, of truth in that scripture. Now, before I even dive into that scripture, it struck me as I was reading that that James wrote this. We all know that, and James was the brother of Jesus. So he lived with the perfect sibling that never lied, that never sinned with their words, and that was always truthful in everything they said. How much pressure do you think that was? I mean, let's be real. He was, um, in hist historically, they think he was the next born after Jesus. So they were closest together. So I can imagine an argument going on and Joseph and Mary come out of the house and Jesus is crying and, and, J and he says, James hit me. And James is like, I didn't hit you, you took my toy. And Jesus is like, you did hit me and I didn't take your toy. I picked it up off the ground, you weren't even playing with it. And so Joseph and Mary, imagine they're just gonna turn both their eyes to James. And be like, James, he's obviously telling the truth. He doesn't lie. Go to your room, you're in timeout, you know? And Jesus will say, Father, forgive him. He didn't know what he was doing. So, I mean, this is, this is, the, 
The, the man who wrote this is, the only, is one of the few people that lived with one, the only person on the earth that ever was perfect in all they said. So I think he knows what his tongue is capable of and he knows what it looks like when you walk with the Holy Spirit and when your life is perfect. Man, I, I just, I'm just thankful. I don't, I don't know what that would have been like, but that was a lot of pressure that he was under. So I think we can take his word for it that he knows what he's talking about. And as Americans, we like to talk. We like to talk and we like to listen to other people talk, podcasts, TV, all these things. We, average American has about 30 conversations a day. That's one fifth of your life. If you put that into books, you would have 66 books per year, 800 pages long each. That's a lot of words. And that's a lot of potential to have problems with our words, isn't it? And they said the average man speaks 15,000 to 20,000 words. The average woman is 30,000 plus. And all the guys say amen. You ask a husband, you know, are you, are you um, frustrated sometimes that your wife has the last word? And he says, no, I'm just happy when she gets to it. So our mouths can get us into a lot of trouble. Like I, I probably just got in trouble there with my wife who's sitting up in Madison and I, me sharing that joke. But our mouths can get us into a lot of trouble. And today I want us to talk through how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this tongue? So verse two says this, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what they say, he's a perfect man or woman able to keep his whole body in check. Now that word perfect is the word teleos in Greek. And it really doesn't mean sinless. It means mature, complete, and whole. So if you can control your tongue, you become mature, complete, and whole and healthy is what it says, healthy. And obviously that's, that's the goal. That's where we want to get to. And, it's, and, and the rest of the chapter says why we don't, want to, we, we, don't, we don't get there. You know, a doctor tells you to open your mouth when you go to the doctor. And they say, say, ah, and they look in your mouth. Why? Because what's in your mouth reveals what's going on inside of you, right? And what our words come, that come out of our mouth reveal what's going on inside of us. And it's, it's, a, it's an indication of what's going on in our heart. So we, we know that there's power in our words. And, and this is something that just kind of blows my mind because one of the ways that we are made in the image of God is that we speak. Because when God spoke, what happened? Creation. When he spoke, his words create. His words created the heavens and the earth. He created us. His words create. Now, our words don't create something out of nothing, but they do have creative power, don't they? Our words can build people up. They can tear people down. They can encourage people. They can discourage people. They can bring uh, destruction on others, or they can bring um, health and encouragement to life, can't they? Our words carry power. That's part of us being made in the image of God. He entrusted us with this thing called words. Jesus is called the word of God. Words are important. And sometimes I wonder why Jesus gave us this power. But I think it, it, he, he entrusted it to us and we're gonna find out why he did and what he's gonna do about it and how he's gonna redeem it here in a little bit. But we have to understand first and foremost that our words have power and we have to watch what we say. And that's what James is going into. So three reasons I wanna give us why we should watch what we say. And then I wanna give us three reasons of how we watch what we say, how we can do this, okay? So the first three, you're gonna realize, man, I, I need to watch, I need to keep my mouth shut. And then the next three, hopefully I'm gonna give you some tools that you can use to be able to step into what God's plan is for your mouth, amen? So the first reason we need to watch what we say is this. My tongue directs where I go. Everyone say directs. The, in verse three, James says this. He says, when we put a bit, a bit bits into horses' mouths, we can turn the whole animal. Have you guys ever seen a jockey with a horse? Typically they're really small men and women, so you imagine a 95 pound jockey on a 2000 pound stallion. But somehow that jockey has control, but it's not the jockey that's really controlling it. It's something even smaller and it's a six inch piece of metal called the bit in the mouth of that horse, right? So that little bit can change the direction. That little bit changes the direction of this massive powerful animal by the will of the, of the jockey. In the same way, a bit of a word can change the direction of a person's life because our words direct where we go. Our words have power to, to, to direct us where we're gonna go. Listen to this. Next one he says, next example, he says, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. 
I don't know if you guys have seen the proportions of a massive ship. Some of the ships these days are uh, 2,000 feet long with a, with a proportionally really small rudder. And even smaller, there's this tiny little man in this little cockpit at the top with a little steering wheel directing this massive, massive ship. No matter what the winds are doing, what the currents are doing, he can take it where he wants it to go. In the same way, our mouths, our tongues are like a rudder. That's what he's saying here. Our tongues are like a rudder, which means they can keep us on course or they can steer us off course. Is that true? Our tongues direct where we want to go. Our words have power to shape us. So if I were to ask you, where, where do you see yourself in the next five, 10 years? What, what direction is your life heading? And you might have some answers for me, but if I listened long enough to your conversation, I could tell you which way your life is going. Your conversation, your words betray where you're going. What you declare with your mouth, oftentimes, what do you talk about the most? What do you talk about the most? Is it, is it financial stress and worry? Then I can tell you, you're gonna be, be on that same path of trying to always have enough and never have enough and work harder in order to get someplace that you don't know where you're going. Because your words, what you say, what, you, what dominates your conversation directs where you go. Like a rudder or like a bit in a horse's mouth. And you know, we, we, we shape our words as we speak them, right? And then as our words come out, guess what? They shape us. Our words shape us. And they don't just shape us, they shape those around us. And this is one of the most sobering and overwhelming thoughts as a parent, that my words have incredible shaping power over the lives of my kids. And I was, as I was reading these, this, this uh, passage and as I'm working on this message, it really started to sober my heart. And I, you know, obviously when you, when you think about all the things and all the ways that you mess up as a parent, it, it's, it's, it's sobering. And it reminded me that God's told me the most powerful words, and this is just a side note, but I want you to get this. The most powerful words that you can say to your kids or to those closest to you is not, I love you. It's, will you forgive me? Why do I say that? Because I know that I'm going to mess up in what I say. Either I'm going to say the wrong thing or I'm going to say the right thing the wrong way, right? And it's going to cause damage to that relationship, to a, to a heart. I have four boys of these young boys that are trying to grow up and say, do I have what it takes? Am I going to be good enough? All these things that are going on in their heart and my words have power over that life. And I know, I, I, I can tell you by, by my experience, almost, almost daily, I have to go to one of my boys and I say those words. Since the Lord taught me this, this has been a, a big part of my parenting life is to say, you know what? I corrected you there and what I said was true, but how I said it was wrong. Will you forgive me for, for losing my temper? And then I'll say, you know, something like maybe, uh, you know, God is a perfect father. I'm not a perfect father and I'm still learning from him. So will you give me grace and forgive me as I'm still learning? And when I say those things, you know what's amazing is they, they are so quick to forgive. They actually don't think less of me, they think more of me because I'm willing to admit my faults and it reconciles the relationship. See, they cannot receive I love you if there's no relationship. If it's been broken, if they're resentful, if they're angry, the words I love you just bounce off. In fact, they can make him even angrier because they said, you don't really love me. You, you know, know what you did to me, how I feel right now. But when you can say, I for, will you forgive me? The power of forgiveness restores relationship and that works in parents, parenting, it works in marriages, it works in jobs, because God created words to have power. So that's just, that's a side note. But our words shape us and our words shape those around us. Proverbs 13 verse three says this, guard your words and you'll guard your life. But if you don't control your tongue, it will ruin everything. Woo, that's pretty straightforward right there. That is written by the wisest man that ever lived besides Jesus, who was Solomon. And there's dozens of other, other Proverbs that speak about our words. Because he knew something about our words and the power of our words. I don't know about you, when I've, at this point, as I was reading through this, as I was reading these different extra verses, I'm thinking, man, I think it's best if I just say nothing. I just need to keep my mouth shut because look what can happen. It can ruin everything. I mean, I don't know about you, this, there's actually a group of monks called the Trappist monks, and several of those monks took vows of silence so that they wouldn't accidentally sin with their words. So we're gonna have duct tape at the door today as you leave and you can take it with you. You can use it however you need, but it's for you, not for your spouse or kids. So it'll help, maybe it'll help you not sin. I don't know, I'm, I'm just kidding. But I kind of feel like that sometimes, man. Why, how, how can I do this? This is, this is intense. The, the power that God's given me with my mouth and with my words is, is, is scary. It's scary. 
But so that's the first one is it directs where I go. Let's keep going, right? There's more to this. My tongue can destroy what I have. I'm just reading through what James says here. So we're gonna go through this together and we're gonna, both, we're gonna all be convicted. It says in James uh, verse five, consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. I was in California this summer. I remember waking up one morning and, and the car that we were driving had little specks of white over it. And I was like, what is that? And my cousin said, that's ash coming in over the mountains because there's a fire burning on the other side. I was there in late July. This fire had started July 13th and it burned till September 30th and it burned over a million acres of land. It was called the Dixie Fire, it happened this year and it was affecting everything around it. The, 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 cl the cloud cover was, was mostly smoke. There was ash over it. Now we weren't in danger, but we were still affected by it. And all that started by one tree that fell and hit a power box and, and sent a spark off. That's the power of, of, of fire and we're like, wow, that's incredible. But you know, the truth is that a, a, a careless camper can destroy a national park, but a careless word can destroy a life. The reason he's making this, this analogy is because it is that powerful. It is that damaging. It can be, right? And we have to be, uh, be careful with what we say. What are some of the kinds of words that are like fire? Gossip, right? Gossip is like a fire. It, it, can, it spreads quickly and, has, can, and, and can do chaotic damage over relationships, over a workplace, right? Lying is like fire or, or hateful words. I think every one of us, if we think about it for a moment, we can think of moments in our lives or in lives of those closest to us that where their words destroyed something, destroyed a relationship, destroyed a marriage, destroyed a, a, a employment or a church or a friendship. Because that was all words. Because words have the potential to destroy what I have. Have you ever met a verbal arsonist? Someone who's really good at just saying the, the right pointed thing at the right time. Sometimes I wished I was that person. Now I read this and I'm glad I'm not that quick with my words <laughs> because sometimes we have to be, our words come out so quickly. It's crazy that we even call it a roast at a wedding. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna roast somebody, you know, and, and it's like, I know it's a toast, but you know, you're, most of the time they roast them. It's, it's, <laughs> that's what they're doing. They're sharing stories. They're trying to say something, but words can destroy, fire can destroy, but in the same way, a fire that's controlled, what does it do? It brings warmth and light and, and energy and power, Right? Fire that's controlled. Same thing with words. Words are powerful. They have the power to burn uncontrollably or when they're controlled, they have the power to bring light and warmth and life. That's the power of our words. So first two. First two is we can, oh, there, here's the next part. It's set on, the, the tongue is set the whole course of his life on fire and it's set on fire by hell itself. That is a pretty scary statement right there. My tongue can be set on fire by hell itself. I don't know about this. When I see this, it starts to make me realize that I have to be accountable for every single, every single thing I say. I have to live with the consequences of every single thing I say. That duct tape's starting to sound pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know about that. I don't know if I can do this. Well, let's go on because we're gonna, we're at one more and then we're gonna get to the how we do this, all right? So stay, stay with me. My tongue displays who I am. My tongue displays who I am. James, this says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. What this does, shows you is whatever is in you comes out of you, right? Whatever is in you comes out of you. It's, it reveals my character. My words tend to betray my character, don't they? They betray who I am. Eventually, it's gonna come out. So right here, it says, you know, one of the most powerful things we can do with our words is praise the Lord, right? Is to worship. We can declare his praises. And it says that our words can actually bless God. The King of Kings on his throne, our prayers go like incense to heaven. That's the power of our words. And that's an incredible, incredible honor and opportunity. But what happens the moment we walk out these doors? First, one moment we're praising the Lord. The next moment we yell at our kids in the car because they wouldn't get in fast enough. Or someone cuts you off in traffic. And you're like, who taught you to drive? You start yelling at that person in, in traffic or whatever it is. All of a sudden, praising and cursing and one verse says, it praises our Lord and then it curses those who are made in the image of God. Whoo, come on. I'm, this is not me, guys. This is James. It's James' fault. What would James do? 
We're, gonna, we're trying to figure out what he's trying to tell us here because this is real stuff. What does he say in the next verse? He says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? What's he saying? The point in this, in this is that whatever is in the well comes out in the water, right? Whatever's in the tree comes out in the fruit. Whatever's in the heart comes out in the words. We have to check the source. You wanna know if a spring is good? You check the source. You go upstream, you check the source to make sure it's good. If you don't wanna know what a tree is, you look at the, what the fruit of a tree is, you look at the tree, you find out if it's a good tree and you, and you eat, can eat the fruit. If you wanna know if your words are good, you look at the heart and you check the source. What that tells me is my problem is not my tongue, my problem is my heart. Our problem, church, is not what's here, it's what's in here that got to this point at, at all, right? It is the root issue is what is going on in my heart that makes me say the things I say. What's going on inside of me? The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all else, but I believe, and he says, who can know it? But then the Holy Spirit says he reveals to us all things. So there's something God wants to do in us that's gonna change and make us aware of this root issue. To be aware of the issue so that we can know what's gonna come when it comes out of our mouth and we can deal with it before it happens. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus was sharing all this stuff with the disciples. He said, four out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. This is a fact. This is a fact. So eventually, no matter what, how, how, how good your filters are, how good your, your church smile is on Sunday mornings, eventually what's in your heart comes out. Sometimes you can keep it in for, for most of the day and act a certain way around your coworkers. And then when you get home, you let your guard down and the people you love the most get the real deal. And it's not always pretty, is it? Because this is the, our words have that kind of power. This is pretty, pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Now, this is where I want you to understand God's, God's got an answer to this human condition. He knew what your heart would be like. He knew that he entrusted you with the power of your words. And he knew that he had an answer for that situation that you're in. Because every single one of us, I think in this room, nobody's in here saying, whoo, glad this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> glad I'm glad I'm, I'm home free and I don't ever use my words to, to, to damage other people. I'm, I'm off the hook. But everybody else in this room needs to listen to this message, right? I don't think there's anybody in this room thinking that because every one of us knows that's me. That's me. There's been those moments when, I've, when what's come out of my heart was not pretty. And I didn't like it. Lord, what can I do? Lord, what can we do? How can I watch what I say? Now we're gonna get into the how, and this is where I wanna bring you some encouragement to the, to the situation of our human condition. How can I watch what I say? The first is, get a new heart. Now that sounds really crazy, doesn't it? Get a new heart, but listen to this. Ezekiel 18, 31 says, rid yourselves of all the offenses you've committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. That's great, but how do we do that? How do we do that? I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm sitting here thinking, God, look at all the stuff that I've done. Look at what I know my heart is deceitful above all else. What can I do about it? And I think up to this point in the passage, I'm looking at this thing and I'm reading what James says and I'm like, this is pretty hopeless for me. I am in trouble because I can't do it. But that's where the good news comes in. When you begin to admit that you can't do it, when you begin to say, God, I need you, God, I surrender to you. Guess what he says? Guess what Jesus says? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is also true. Those words are just as true as the other words we've read. It's the same Bible. You know what that means? It says, if anyone is in Christ, if you know the Lord, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are a new creation. That means that the old, the things that used to come out of you, that, that's no longer who you are because all the old has passed away and the new has come. And I know he's not finished with me. I know I'm not perfect, but I know if he can change me, he can change you. And if he's making me new, he's making all things new in you. And he is worthy and he is able to change this, this deceitful heart and do something amazing with my life. 
Come on, can we give him praise for that? Can we give him praise? Because he is working on you and he's not finished with you and his mercy is new every morning. He is creating in you a new heart. And when that heart, as he works on your heart, guess what? It begins to work on your words. It begins to change your speech. And all of a sudden, where cursing came out more often, praise begins to come out more often. Prayer begins to come out more often. Come on, somebody. God begins to change you from the inside out. And you, many, many of you know, man, I, I know I'm not perfect. I know I've messed up, but I'm not where I was. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not where I was. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. The second, second way we do this, ask God for help daily. Ask God for help daily. See, you know that your words, you say things daily, 30 plus conversations a day. So if it was, if it was enough just to come in on a Sunday morning, sing a few songs, feel, feel good about yourself, which maybe you're gonna go out of here feeling a little bit like, whew, he bruised me up a little today, but you come in into this one day a week thing and you go out, now I'm gonna do it on my own, God. I know I believe in you, but let me just try to live this life on my own. That's, that's such a trap and it's such a lie because you can't do it. You can't do it. You need his help daily. You need him to be with you daily. And, and David knew this more than anyone. Listen to what he said. He said, Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. That's a good prayer to pray every single day, isn't it? That's a prayer that you can post on your mirror in the morning so you can start to read that. He also said in another verse, he said in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David was considered a man after God's heart. And he still said, I need you to renew me. I need you to create a clean spirit in me because I've, I've gone through some life. I've had some people say some things about me. I've had some bitterness and unforgiveness in my heart that's coming out in what I say. I need you to renew me. I need you to change me from the inside out. Begin to ask God daily for a fresh start because his mercy is new every day. And let me challenge you to begin every day using your words to pray, to worship, and to read the word of God. That's all about words. It's all about words. And when you begin to do that, it's redeeming. It's filling your heart and it's declaring the praises of God. And you can go into your day with the words of praise on your lips, not words of cursing, words of prayer on your lips, not words of, of, of condemnation for yourself or for others. Sometimes the person we're most negative with is our self-talk, it's ourself. And God wants to transform that too. The last thing, think before I speak. Think before I speak. Solomon said this also, intelligent people think before they speak. What they say is then more persuasive. What does your tongue say about you? What does it show that you're going? And if you're like me, when I, when I really take an honest look at myself, I can say, man, there's a lot of, of things that come out of me that are based on things that have happened to me, based on maybe some of the family habits that I've grew up in because these things can travel from family member to family member from generation to generation, right? And God wants to break some of those things. Keep the, keep the good, but break some of the bad so that you can be redeemed and you can be set free. Because the truth is our tongue truly does have power to rule our lives. It affects the direction of our life. It affects whether we build up or destroy and it shows who we are. But the, and the only way, the only way church, listen to me, the only way we get control of our tongue is to let Jesus have control of our heart. And that sounds cliche, but it is so, so true. And I believe today God wants us to set our hearts on Him and to just surrender to Him in a fresh way so that He can say, God, I know what's been in me. I want you to fill me up. I want you to have mercy on me because I, I, you've entrusted me with this power called words. And I wanna use it to build, to encourage, to bring life to others, to speak life over others. Even if life and de if death has been spoken over me, I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna speak life. I'm gonna forgive and I'm gonna walk out and I'm gonna speak love and forgiveness in life. God wants to do some healing today, I believe. See, there are two different kinds of tongues that can control your life. One is your tongue and one's the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what happened at the day of Pentecost? You guys remember? What, ha what came down on people when the Holy Spirit came? Come on, somebody tongues of fire. So God was saying that, you know, yes, hell can, set, hell can set a tongue on fire, but so can heaven. 
Heaven can set your tongue on fire. Heaven can make your words something supernatural. And what was the first thing that changed in the believer? What was the first thing that was touched in the believer when they were filled with the Holy Spirit? It was their speech. He redeemed their speech and they began to declare the praises of God. Come on. That's what God wants to do. He wants to fill you with his spirit so that you will just, you can't help it because what they do, it said they just opened their mouths and and it just began to declare the praises of God. And it's like, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you let him fill you up, you can't help but declare his praises wherever you go. And the water of life just pours out that poison and bitter water that's been in you, that someone else has poured into you and it just washes all that out and you begin to be a person of praise, a person of prayer, a person that speaks life everywhere we go. That's his, that's his desire for every single one of us. This quote is amazing. The proof, this is Sidlow Baxter said this, the proof of being spirit-filled is not just speaking in other unknown languages, but controlling the tongue that you do know. Oof. The Holy Spirit wants to fill us up today. But the first, first and foremost, he wants to have your heart.